Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining our webinar on how 15 year olds learn English. I'm Sasha Ramirez. I'm the Edu Communications Manager at the OECD. Today, being able to communicate in English is essential. In fact, it's taught in more than half the world's countries, far more than any other language. When my mother emigrated to Canada from Mexico in the 1960s, she was lucky enough to have good classroom instruction. But she also told me that she learned a lot of her English from the Beatles. Today, it's easier than ever before for people, young people to learn English. They have many, many sources to choose from, whether it's TikTok, movie streaming, music, online platforms. There are lots of opportunities for young people to learn English. So how is this changing the way that 15-year-olds learn English? What are the implications for classroom-based learning? I'm pleased to welcome our distinguished panel, who will help us to answer some of these and other questions. First is Anna Solamina. She's a senior expert at the European Commission. With us also is Dr. Hanan Khalifa, who's a language testing and evaluation expert. Next, we have Selma Koyunku, who's a teacher of English at Puistopulun, I hope I pronounced that right, comprehensive school in Helsinki, Finland. And finally, I'm very pleased to announce that we have Stavros Kontos, who's an English language student at the Second Model General Lyceum of Athens in Greece. Now, before we get started with our panel, let me invite Sophia Eriksson, who's the Director of Youth Education and Erasmus Plus Europe at the European Commission, who will help share some opening remarks for us. Sophia, over to you. Thank you so much, Sasha. And dear participants, dear Andreas, dear panelists, it's a pleasure to be here at the occasion of the release of this new report on language learning and, and the focus on how 15-year-olds learn English today. Well, multilingualism is both a founding principle and an enduring commitment of the European Union. And is there a better way to illustrate what it means being united in diversity? Probably not. Knowing languages is a key competence, as we say. It enables mobility, it supports employability, but it also fosters awareness and mutual understanding across borders. And we have a strong EU objective, which is that every young person should have had the opportunity to learn two languages in addition to the language of schooling by the end of upper secondary education. Now we know that English is the most learned language in schools across Europe. Actually more than 98% of students in lower secondary education are studying English, but we don't know much about learning outcomes. And significant resources are being invested in teaching and learning foreign languages. But what are the competence levels? So I'm really pleased that the OECD and the European Commission are closely collaborating on all this. And we've done it for several years, and in particular in the development of a module for assessing foreign language competences through the Program for International Student Assessment, the well-known PISA. It will be ready for general rollout on a voluntary basis as a component of PISA 2025. And we have 23 countries, including 16 EU member states that will be participating. And the language that will be assessed in this first edition will be English. So the PISA's foreign language assessment module will be based on the European framework of reference for language competences, the so-called CEFR, and offer comparable results. And it will give us a wealth of information about the participating countries. Now, the report that has been published today with European Commission co-financing, it has to be seen as a stepping stone in the run-up to the PISA 2025 foreign language assessment. It includes precious information on the way that 15-year-olds are learning English in five different countries. We want to understand the factors of success in language learning inside schools, but also outside the schools. And one of the results of the study is that students, teachers and school leaders actually seek more and more opportunities to practice the language and spend time abroad. So this is a very positive development. And of course, I need to make the point here and, uh, and give some uh, publicity uh, that the EU flagship program Erasmus Plus is a great enabler of such opportunities. Because language learning is embedded in all actions and fields of the program, be it mobility or cooperation projects. And there are also collaborative platforms for teachers, such as the European School Education Platform and its e-twinning component, 
that integrate language learning. And one novelty of the Erasmus Plus program since 2021 is that pupils from general school education can now fully benefit from Erasmus Plus and go abroad individually or with their class, in addition to higher education students and vocational education and training learners. The program has also put online language support in place to help participants to prepare for their mobility um, and learning the language of their host country. So there's a lot of evidence that learning mobility contributes to boosting language learning skills. And mobility is a powerful learning experience also for teachers. It reinforces their capacity to innovate and to reflect on practices with a view to better meeting the needs of learners. So to further promote cross-border learning mobility for learners, educators and staff, the Commission adopted in November last year a proposal for a council recommendation called Europe on the Move, learning mobility opportunities for everyone. And language learning is one of the remaining obstacles to mobility as recognized by this recommendation. So therefore the policy ambition to boost language learning will for sure contribute to open new opportunities also for learning mobility. And I should say the Europe on the Move proposal includes as well ambitious targets. For example, it is set 25% for higher education mobility and 15% for vocational education and training mobility. So this proposal is currently discussed with EU member states, with the Council of EU ministers, and we do hope that they agree to keep up a high political ambition at the end. So I'm now eager to hear the presentations of the main results of the study and listen to the panel. Thank you very much. Well, thanks so much, Sophia. Wow, that's astonishing. 98% of students across the EU are learning English. I did not know that. Um, thanks also for introducing the report and on the important work that the EU is doing in this respect. Um, but as you said, you know, it's time to hear some more about the findings from the report. So let me turn to Andreas Schleicher, who's the Director of Education and Skills at the OECD, who will walk us through some of the key findings of the report. Andreas, please go ahead. Thanks, Sasha, and thanks, Sophia, for your leadership in promoting languages in, in, in Europe and the world, and but also for the fantastic support you have uh, given to us to make it possible to actually look at the language skills of young people. And uh, as you said, as a prerequisite for that, we really wanted to find out, you know, how do young people actually learn languages these days? Not just to, before we are going to see the results from PISA. And I'm going to share my screen. Uh, you should be seeing it now. And I want to start with something that, you know, we may not always have on our radar screen, and that is how different the environments are in which students learn languages. Now, as you can see here, countries follow very different models for language learning. They start at very different ages. Uh, the duration of programs varies, the intensity of programs vary, and, and, and students who leave upper secondary education high school actually are expected to reach quite different proficiency levels. Some may take a compulsory exam, others can choose to, and what you can see here, this is why international comparisons are so interesting, so relevant in a field where countries choose quite different approaches, and we're going to see what is it effective now. And there's something else that makes it worse to take a more detailed look at how students learn English. And you can see that here. And uh, Sophia already alluded to this. Now, learning foreign language is not just enabling us to communicate, you know, in webinars like this one uh, in, in life, but it makes a real difference in so many different aspects. You can see here in this chat, you know, how students who speak more than one language have greater respect for other cultures. It opens your mind. It makes you more open to different ways of thinking. They have more positive attitudes to students with a migrant background. They have greater awareness of themselves and greater self-efficacy towards global issues. They have more of a sense, I can change this world because I have access to the world and the languages and the knowledge of this world. You might think, well, you know, that's all about wealthier students <laughs> having more advantages. But even when you discount for that effect, and that's the blue dot here, you can see a lot of that remains. But again, how do we learn foreign languages? The first you might think, well, you know, digitalization has changed the world around us. Probably it changed also the way in which we change, uh, learn languages. But, you know, actually, uh, 
smartphones, you know, that are everywhere, instant messaging and so on, have had perhaps less of an impact on language learning, at least in school, than we might think. Uh, but to find out in more detail, we visited uh, five countries. And in fact, through those school visits, uh, we interviewed students, we interviewed teachers, school leaders, and uh, did some lesson observations. And we took really a deep dive into how 15-year-olds learn English today. The first thing that we understood was that learning English actually translates you know, transcends classroom walls. It's not just happening in school. In a typical day for a 15-year-old, you know, the students we survey in our PISA studies, they might, of course, you know, have a kind of hour of English. But beyond that lesson, students have so many interactions with English these days. You know, inside the school, outside the school, they read books, they watch TV, they do some gaming, they listen to music, they browse social media, the internet messaging friends all over the world, you name it. So the language lesson in school may be the catalyst, but it's just one out of many elements. And, you know, uh, in many countries, I've marked them in green, students are typically switching between English and their own language. They throw in, you know, some English phrases to get their point across or their research, you know, on a web page in English to add to what they can find in their own language as they start to mix things. And whoever we spoke with, you know, students were actually quite proud of that. They enjoy being able to use, you know, English or at least some English uh, in their first language and to easily jump between different languages. Now, that was really fun for the students we spoke with. And that increased exposure to English appears to bring both, you know, benefits and also challenges. In general, students mention direct linguistic benefits. You know, they have more vocabulary. They learn how to pronounce words in English. Uh, teachers, when we surveyed them, they were more likely to identify metalinguistic benefits, you know, sensitivity to the language, openness to other cultures, and so on. And also they, and also their school leaders often mentioned indirect benefits, you know, such as helping students see the, the usefulness, now, why do I learn languages? Now, by applying it, you get a much better sense than just by sitting in a classroom. Uh, but teachers also saw some challenges, now, some focused on, you know, linguistic inaccuracies, you know, the language you learn on the street or on a game might not always be uh, the, of the highest quality. There will be different tensions or there will be, you know, some tensions between different types of English used inside and outside school, you know, inside school, you learn Shakespeare, outside school, you learn, you know, uh, language of the street and so on. And they also said that out of school exposure is often unequal across different groups of students, naturally. The young people in urban uh, schools or those living in diverse neighborhoods often have an advantage. They have more contact with English in their daily, daily lives and advantage students also can often access, you know, more expensive options, you know, like student exchanges, like summer camps, like private education. All of that, of course, is uh, uh, an issue. And there's also no question that digital technologies have driven increased exposure to English, you know, outside school. Most of what you find on the web is in English these days across countries. The activities that students reported most frequently were all those involving digital technology, right? You watch videos, you watch films or series, you browse the internet, you use social media, and that's where English really comes into play. Right? But there has also been uh, much less of a digital transformation. You know, out of school, the, the technology is everywhere, it transforms our lives, but actually inside school, we see that the digital transformation has not necessarily arrived. Now, many of the participants that we interviewed see the benefits of using technology uh, to, to make lessons more engaging, to make them more relevant to students' life in all countries. Teachers used uh, technology such as game-based apps for quizzes and to access different, you know, materials, video content. In some schools, you know, schools also use technologies themselves. But, you know, if we take an honest look at this, generally, teachers are still digitizing analog approaches to foreign language teaching. Now, most of the exposure to students comes from traditional kind of English books. Now, we didn't really see great examples of how technology is, you know, 
really transforming teaching and learning language, at least not so far. That may come in the future. Now, for example, today's technologies can, you know, enable collaborative, interactive learning spaces that can exist well beyond the foreign language classroom. Now, you can do that at home. You know, technology can actually, you know, uh, be very adaptive and uh, responsive to your needs. Teachers can create more time for learners to speak in today's world. I'm going to come back to this. No? Developments in artificial intelligence mean technology can now easily provide much greater personalization and the support also much better feedback while you learn a language you know technology can actually help you you know correct mistakes get better and so on to improve the quality not just you know of reading but also students writing students speaking technology is there but we have not seen that much of this in classrooms today access to quality technical infrastructure remains also a barrier in many countries simply where the technology exists. It's not yet available often, but I would say, you know, from our experience, it was often that teachers, you know, were not really aware of what is possible in this field and what's available. So there is still a lot of work to be done in the, in the future on this. Now. And uh, there's one more thing I want to bring to your attention and what our counterparts felt was often missing in most language learning at school, was the opportunity to speak. Now, when you look at, you know, in every interview we ask, you know, in a dream world, you know, if everything is like you would like it to be, what would make English teaching and learning better? And if you look at the responses, you know, you can see them here, basically everywhere across all participant groups, increasing the opportunity for students to actually speak the language you know, in all lessons, in extracurricular activities, that's really seen as the key step to enhance students' learning proficiency, and we still see too little about it. And that's also you know, our aspiration in the PISA assessment, when we assess it not just to look at writing, but to look at the speaking competencies as well. So that's just you know, a taster of some of the international findings from the report that is coming out today. And there are also some key national findings for each country that uh, could be very valuable. And, uh, I hope you're going to look at the report to find out more. And with that, I hand back to you, Sasha. Thanks very much, Andreas. A lot of food for thought there. I like especially that you brought up this issue of motivation. It certainly echoes my own experience of learning German. I tried and failed to, to take a few German classes, but it was only when I met my now wife, then girlfriend, that my, my German language learning really took off. So so thanks very much for that. Um, I want to go to the panel now. And, and before I do, I want to thank everyone who's joined online. Uh, we have many, many people with us from around the world. Please don't hesitate to send any questions that you have for the panel in the chat. Uh, we'll be happy to get to as many of them as we can at the end. So let me welcome our panel now who will uh, dive a little bit deeper into some of these issues. But I wanna start with Stavros. Now Stavros is a, a real world example of somebody who is actually learning English from Greece. Um, Stavros, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, walk us through a little bit uh, first of all, you know, why you want to learn English. Why is it important for you in your own life to actually speak English? Um, it, we used it in all the day with my friends in the social media. Uh, we can't live without them. It's a part of our, of our life anymore. And... It's, it's something important. Interesting. So even uh, with your friends in Greece, you're speaking English on social media, or is this for friends around the world? Uh, more in social media. Uh, I don't have a lot of friends outside of the Greece. I have do a lot of trips, but I can't make a friendship. So just uh, more is with my friends in Greece, and it's in social media. In real life, we use some words, but not so much. Interesting. So social media really is the key, the key to how you're, why you're learning English uh, uh, with your friends. And, and tell us a little bit about how you actually learn English. I know you're, you're taking some private lessons. What does that look like in terms of how you learn uh, English in the classroom and outside of the classroom as well? Yeah. In private lessons, we have we are smaller classrooms with a little um we, we have we don't ask so much students in one classroom and we can talk more and the teacher can uh, focus in each student 
at the time she has. Uh, in, in public, we can't, uh, the teacher have to teach 20, 25 students and in the hour we have, we can't. Mm. That's really interesting. So you're saying in your private lessons, the teacher has more time to spend with each student and you also have more time to actually speak, right? Yes, that's right. Uh -huh. So this actually echoes what Andreas was saying that really, you know, students need to be given the opportunity to actually speak and interact with others. And do you have a lot of chance to then apply what you learned in your private lessons to social media world to talking to your friends? Uh, we, in social media, we say, we share it, we share with my friends videos from in, American or English creators, so all the words they used, we have to understand them, and it start to be our life. This interesting. So sharing videos, sharing content, and talking to your friends as well makes a big difference. Very good. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, Stavros. That's really helpful. I'll come back to you a little bit later. I want to learn more about uh, your experiences in learning English. But let me turn to Selma now. Selma, talk to us a little bit about how this resonates with you. Um, how does this resonate with your students in Finland? And, you know, uh, how is this changing the way that uh, English is taught there? Hello, everyone. Thank you. Um, it's, of course, very understandable thing. Nowadays, like, you know, in Finland, uh, like any other countries, we have different situation if we compare from the past. And the technology is developing, definitely it has an effect and we need a lot of uh, new research about it. And when I like to you know, have a look at the slides Andres share with us, uh, actually there are different results, but uh, one thing is very common. So the students need about the use of the language. So it just like, you know, comes to my, 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 my mind. It's like, we need to focus on, because what I see in the classroom, the students understanding reading, understanding listening is quite high. So it, definitely this comes from uh, technology. Every children, especially the young children, sharing like everything on the social media they are using, of course, in Europe, we have more opportunity for students traveling. And in Finland, the number of the immigrants also are getting like higher and higher. So they have like friends outside that they can use like, you know, English with their friends when they are playing some games or like, you know, doing any kind of sport. So their background knowledge, their prerequisites for the language learning is definitely different now. And so then, you know, as a teacher, of course, we we just, you know, try to do something. But I totally agree. The effect of technology is not totally ready in our classroom because we still have to use the printed material. So in every school, we have like course book, although we use like, you know, the recent published material. Maybe like, you know, one week ago, we have like, you know, published something. It can be like, you know, old for today. So the fast like, you know, the pace of like technology changing is quite different. We have in Finland uh, a new, uh, re relatively re new uh, curriculum. So still the teachers um, training, we need a lot. And then we have like, you know, some kind of development about the material. So it has some advantages for students, for us, because we need to do we need to like, you know, uh, get ready for this, like, you know, change, but also at the same time, we need support from the, like, you know, government's level or policymaker level. So much so I can ask, are you seeing a difference in terms of the way your students are actually interacting with you around English language instruction based on some of the changes that have come in their own lives about how they engage with English? Does this actually affect how they, how they engage in the classroom? Definitely, it affects, uh, especially when we are talking about something in common, like, you know, a viral things on social media or trending topic. If you just, you know, bring such a topic in the classroom, it is always like, you know, interesting and they would like it. Of course, it's more interesting than like, you know, reading some kind of historical thing on a printed like, you know, material. So you can take their attention. If you take their attention, the motivation level is so high 
in that level, like you can teach whatever you would like to teach. Because at the end of the day, we are not teaching only language, actually. It's like, you know, language teaching is like, you know, beyond like, you know, grammar, beyond like reading and learning vocabulary. We are teaching them cultural elements and accepting maybe others' opinion, like uh, cultural things and multiliteracies, many things inside the language learning and teaching. So focusing on Taylor Swift lyrics rather than Shakespeare probably has uh, has some positive outcomes for for learning the language. I think Fantastic. Just, thanks. You know, sorry. Uh, sorry. Like you know, I think when we just you know at the kind of like you no know, technological things inside, even like you know Shakespeare can be like you know interesting to our students. Absolutely, absolutely. I, let's. I do want to come back to this issue of technology, though. I think it's very important. You and Andreas have both raised. But let me turn to Anna now. Anna, can you give us a perspective from the EU uh, what this increased exposure to English means at the EU level and how it's affecting the way the EU uh, engages on English language learning? Uh, yes, Sasha, with pleasure. First of all, I would like to share um, a little bit of recent data on what we see is happening inside and outside the classrooms in all of EU countries. So inside uh, the classrooms, we have a recent publication, which we call Euridice, a report on teaching languages at school in Europe. We, we publish it every seven years. And we see that uh, some things uh, have been changing in the last years. The first one is the English is being taught from a much earlier age than before across Europe mostly from the beginning of primary, between six and eight years old. Um, the time of instruction that it represents in primary is around five to 10%, and then for secondary between 10 and 20%. And uh, like Sophia said in the beginning, 98%, a little bit more, of pupils across Europe are learning English in lower secondary. We also see that a lot of member states have introduced CLIL programs. That means that at least some of the subjects are taught in a foreign language and uh, most of the time it is English. So overall, there is an increased exposure um, in the in the time that the, the pupils are learning. And then outside of the classroom, we, we also have very, very recent data. We are actually about to publish a Eurobarometer, uh, which is a survey across Europe on Europeans and their languages. And we see that 79% of young people report that they feel comfortable communicating in their first foreign language. Uh, and that is again, mostly English. That is in comparison to 59% for the general population. So the youth uh, feels more comfortable in English than, than the average population. And we also hear that one in three of these younger respondents between 15 and 24 years old say that they are using English every single day. Also compared with the last survey, which was in 2012, we see that the, the use of English has increased in almost every scenario that they were being asked about, going abroad, using the internet, watching films, television, listening to the radio, watching news, reading books. Again, this was more marked among the youth. Again, something that surprised us, or well, surprised us that we saw had changed, was that compared with seven, with 10 years ago, uh, the preference for subtitle content has increased a lot. So now more than half of the Europeans prefer to watch foreign films and programs with subtitles when before they preferred that uh, content. So this has increased in 11 percentage points. Again, younger respondents prefer the subtitles even more with two thirds. So in conclusion, a steady increase in exposure in the proficiency and in the use of English. We are, however, a bit more concerned regarding the progress in the second foreign languages, in the other than, than English languages, because there we see a very small improvement in the last 10 years. Also, uh, in the when we look at what's happening in the classrooms, we see that it is not being, uh, you, you know, taught to students much more this time than seven times around. So less exposure for the other languages. Thanks, Anna. Fascinating. I, I'm just curious, does this really ex explosion of English language instruction and, and desire to learn English, does it come at any cost uh, to the local language, to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the language that students, you know, often first learn? Um, do you see any sort of impact on, on, on local language, especially when those, you know, are languages kind of at risk of disappearing uh, as well? 
um, we do not think that uh, learning English or any other language is detrimental to the to the first language or to the main language of schooling. There is space in in children's brains for many languages. So uh, no, I don't think that this would be the cause for any for any bad result in the first language. There may be others, maybe like lack of reading or like lack of uh, other things, but not not the fact that we are exposed to more languages. Wonderful, thanks, Emma. Uh, and and just to mention one comment from the from the audience, you know, uh, Yevgenia from Ukraine is saying that you know it's so important to learn English uh, as a process to make friends um, with all around the world. Uh, and you know, obviously in this time, it's it's you know that, that such a comment is really welcome coming from Ukraine. Uh, global solidarity, global friendship uh, with with young people is really important. Uh, Hanan, let me turn to you now. Uh, you know, one thing that Stavros mentioned was that. Uh, in Greece, there's a lot of private instruction around English. Um, you know, what are the implications for um, the independent study of languages? And, you know, does this actually have a, a bad news for school systems or how does it affect school systems themselves? Well, <clears throat> let's look at the good things first, yeah? It increases motivation. It addresses what uh, Stavros was saying about uh, the, the classroom, the size of the classroom and the one-to-one -one attention. And also, it's also asking about why, why is this growing phenomena of private tutoring, whether it's online tutoring or face-to-face -face, uh, tutoring. Some of it could be peer pressure or societal pressure. Oh, my friend next to me in the same classroom is taking a private lesson in English. Why am I not taking a private lesson in English? And I think the report uh, addresses some of those uh, rationale behind the private uh, tuition. One of the good things as well, it makes school systems and policy makers and decision makers ask themselves, what is it that we're not doing that we, that we need to do in order to eradicate uh, private tuition, which is a parallel economy in some, um, in some countries. Um, the good thing as well, it increases parental choice. And also if we ask ourselves, is there actually a gain in the long run about uh, from having private tuition, does it also give, uh, um, we know that it could widen inequalities, but also if I come from um, a less advantageous background and if I've taken a private lesson, does that actually raises my chances for better employment or not? So I, it's not a black and white response, Sasha. And I, if I may, I wanna, um, I want to disagree with Anna actually about language and um, and losing your first language. Maybe it's not happening in in the EU, but in some countries, in some other countries uh, where English is seen, of course, as the lingua franca, there are worries that uh, uh, our own native language, for example, um, I, I'm an Arabic language spe speaker, that this is not really spoken much and English is taking over. So there are also these worries about language and identity. Thanks so much, Anand. Yes, absolutely, yes. I mean, that that does uh, echo some things that I've read about, you know, also people losing indigenous languages and things like that, that that can be an issue. So interesting to have those two different perspectives on the topic. Uh, and I have to say that your, your comment, Hanan, about the uh, experience of learning in classrooms where they can be overcrowded, they don't have time to teach students individually, has also been echoed from some of our audience members here. I know I have somebody called Zuelia from Turkey who's saying that, you know, classrooms are just too crowded, that they don't have time to get to each student individually. Um, Andreas, let's turn to you now. And, uh, you know, really, from your perspective, if English transcends the classroom, well, you know, what role is there for governments and policymakers in this whole discussion? I mean, have you heard about some of the complexities from Hanan and Anna? Uh, what can policymakers do to really ensure that, that we get the balance right of private and public uh, tuition and uh, to improve learning outcomes for all students? First of all, I think governments have influence over, you know, how much students get exposed to language in the school setting, you know, design curricula, they think about implementation, they, you know, decide how much, you know, speaking is <clears throat> playing a role in language learning or not. So I think the in-school influence is the most obvious area. But what we hear from, you know, from everyone here is how much the world outside schooling can make a difference. And I do think, you know, governments can do a lot to create an environment where, you know, languages are more prevalent, where it's easier to access uh, language learning outside the schooling context. And I think we should look at this broader picture. You know, we should also 
look not just at the immediate benefits, you know, you can communicate better, but at the indirect benefits to create a more open society, a society where people are more willing to engage with people who think differently, who come from other cultures. I just think, you know, we should look at this broader picture and see that we create, you know, the foundations for an open society by the through the capacities of people to see the world through different lenses and perspectives and to appreciate different ways uh, ways of thinking in different cultures and i think actually you know even if it comes to you know enabling you know uh, non traditional ways of learning informal ways of learning i think we should look at that whole picture and see how public policy can you know uh, enable as many young people as possible through as many different ways as possible to engage with with language learning Thanks so much, Andreas. Yeah, absolutely. I think this uh, English language learning as a vehicle for building social emotional skills, I think, is, is a really important aspect of the discussion. And I think one that um, uh, definitely uh, bears further further discussion. Um, so let's go to a, a second round. And here we'll talk about, you know, what is our dream of a future vision for English language learning? Um, what if we could do anything? What kind of system would we put in place? Uh, and I want to encourage the audience, please, to share your own views in the chat. Um, I, that would be really interesting to hear from you. You know, if you were to design a, a system where we could learn English, what would that look like? But Stavros, let me start with you again. Uh, share with us, you know, if you were going to be in charge of all English language instruction in Greece, private, public, social media, everything else, what would that look like for you? What kind of system would you design? In the dream world, I would like to... Uh, you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, in the dream world, I would like to be taught with the e training way. Um, uh, it is a pro European program where schools from different countries uh, cooperate to complete a common project and using the same language, of course, English. And I think that helps the students as much the teachers and make them use in a real life uh, the English language. That's Thanks so much. Yeah. So e-twinning, e e I think you said that's that's really interesting because that also echoes uh, what we know from uh, the literature about actually having a project to do, you know, rather than just being told something and asked to memorize it. Given, giving you something to do where you have hands-on, you get to build it, you get to work on it. That helps you to learn English. Is that right? Yes, that will help a lot, I believe. That's really interesting. Good. And in, uh, in that kind of scenario, uh, is there still a place for private tuition and school tuition as well? Or how does that work? No, I, I, the, I, I don't like the private way, but it is a reality for Greece. Interesting. Good. And and do your your friends also they're interested in this kind of concept as well, this e twinning? Um the most students in Greece I there is in the program and do a lot of things. So I believe they would like it too. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. Good. Uh, Salma, what do you think about that? I mean, how does this resonate with you? Um share with us, you know, your kind of vision for such a system. What what would that look like? Uh, I was thinking like, you know, nowadays it's participatory pedagogy is quite important. So I just try to dream uh, to hear like young people's voices in our planning, in our lesson inside itself, like the implementation part and even like, you know, the assessment. I just try to like, you know, see how we uh, plan everything together, because then if they are like, you know, inside their own learning, everything would be like, you know, easier, would be more enjoyable. And then, you know, teacher, students like, you know, interaction or the interaction between uh, like, you know, young people among themselves also will, I believe like, you know, it will increase uh, their potential in their learning system. So uh, activating students as kind of change agents, as empowering them to also shape the discussion, shape how they're taught. Yeah, there's a, like, you know, saying, it's quite like, you know, uh, tell me I do, you remember, like, you know, the saying thing, and do, I do, and I learn. So we try to, like, you know, take their attention 
in their own learning system. When they, when we just, you know, allow them do something, try to plan what would you like to learn and how would you like to learn and how would you like me to assess you? Mm -hmm. So let's decide beforehand and try to do our best and let's just, you know, make use of all the technological like developments, mm -hmm. why not? And of course, like, you know, like Anna said, also the mother language or any kind of things that can help us. Because our aim is to teach them and their aim is to learn them so they can just, you know, make use of whatever available. So that might mean that all teachers will have to sign up for Fortnite accounts and start playing video games with your students and, uh, oh, and teaching them surreptitiously that way. Why not? <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Salma. Uh, Anna, give us a perspective from the EU. How does this resonate with what you're hearing from across the EU? Well, I, I think that uh, most English teachers would want uh, smaller groups so that they can be uh, more practice because interaction is in the end the most important. They would also possibly want less heterogeneity in the level of English uh, of their pupils that would also facilitate uh, um, teaching. Uh, but what we hear from all of them is that they want more opportunities to speak the language in real life situations. No, uh, And here again, I have to remind that Erasmus Plus offers opportunities for, for mobility, but also for cooperation uh, between schools and interaction between students. And I'm very happy that Stavros made use to e-twinning because that is a European platform that is precisely facilitating this communication between teachers and classrooms. And using languages in a fun way is, of course, the best way to learn them. I think that um, another thing that has potential, and Andrea said it in the presentation, more potential that is being used is, is digital tools and artificial intelligence. Um, perhaps there is still lack of awareness on the added pedagogical, pedagogical value sorry, that they can offer. Uh, because uh, they can offer individualized support. And we see that each student has their own way of learning that, that works better for him than for another. No? And a teacher cannot personalize as much as that because they have too many students in the classroom. No? And it's, of course, expensive to have smaller groups or individualized attention. But the AI can then... Uh, do that a little bit in the place of the teacher and identify patterns and provide some personalized uh, feedback to each student. So this is something that could be explored further. Um, and then also we see different strategies can, can lead uh, all to different good results. For instance, in the case of Greece, they are learning um, earlier and earlier. Uh, so they are betting on that, and that's excellent. On the other hand, in the Netherlands, they introduce English a little later, but uh, they often give classes in subjects uh, in English, what we call CLIL, Content and Language Integrated Learning, and that also gives good results. So that there are different kinds of good practices. Um, and in general, what we see is, of course, the, the, the key is exposure and having, use, use, having fun using the language. Uh, yeah, very, very good practical points there. I think that's that's very helpful. And thanks also for bringing up the issue of digital technology. I want to put a pin in that because we'll come back to that in the next round of questions. Um, but uh, just to mention that we've had some uh, comments from our audience echoing the things that you guys have said. And one important point from Pamela Zafraya is saying that, you know, these are all great points, but we need good teacher training. Teachers need to be upskilled. They need to be trained and they, they need to be empowered to basically take on this new model if, if we're to implement these kinds of things. So I think that's a really important point. Uh, we also have a good comment from Elena Chemiazzo, who's saying that in a dream world, you know, it's really important to uh, encourage speaking, um, to motivate the students, and that it should really be hands-on. Uh, and wherever we can use music, that's also a huge asset. So thanks very much for those comments. Uh, more coming in from the audience. Uh, and we'll, we'll be glad to pick those up as we can. Um, but I want to go now to Hanan and really talk about, from your perspective, what kind of things could we do that could transform the way that students are learning English in schools? Okay, so if I was um, a policymaker, I would thank OECD for the opportunity that they have provided uh, via PISA for foreign language assessment. And why is that? Because it will give me data that I can decide on it, on the solutions that I need, whether it is about the upskilling of teachers in English or whether it is, where, is, where are my students really? What is my base point? For the time being, countries have their various in, uh, assessment procedures, but PISA FLA provides me with that benchmark, with that international benchmark. So that's one. 
the use of international benchmarking. And once again, thank you, OECD, for PISA FLA. The second thing, uh, it's a known fact that what doesn't get assessed doesn't get taught. Speaking um, from what Andreas was showing in that very first or second slide, only one of the five countries actually assess speaking and the other four don't. I would highly encourage that speaking is assessed, whether it is assessed via AI or via a human, uh, a human is, is, is another story, but at least let's get it assessed. Let's get it assessed within the school system. Number three, I would go to what Anna was saying, which is about CLIL and the introduction of CLIL in the educational uh, system. Um, I went to a state funded bilingual school and that's how I learned my English. So, and there are various models of bilingual education and, and CLIL. Number four, it's about exposure and immersion. And there are various ways of doing that. And it's exposure and immersion inside the school. So one of the easy things that the school can do it is to say to the kids, uh, right, when you are at your break, use English in your interaction with each other. And, um, and also give confidence to the students, to the kids, uh, that they're not gonna be losing face if they make uh, uh, a mistake in pronunciation or if they use the, long, the wrong vocabulary, it's encourage them actually to make mistakes and to rectify those mistakes. So these will be my four, four points. Excellent, all excellent points. Uh, uh, you mentioned uh, giving kids the confidence that they won't lose face and uh, you know giving them exposure and immersing them, asking them to, to speak uh, English during their breaks as well. So interesting to, to hear how, see how that works in practice. My, my son is in a, a French school and he speaks German, but all of, all of the kids anyways are, are speaking English anyways during the breaks. So uh, I hope that's, uh, you know, this we could also encourage him to, to learn different languages as well that way. So Andreas, and I mentioned the PISA 4 language assess, uh, assessment, you know, uh, what's your vision kind of for the future of that? And I think also she mentioned something really interesting, which is using AI assessments uh, potentially for the spoken portion. Um, so if you know it, it, the, the future of the piece of FLA, what would that look like? And, you know, do you see a role for AI in that as well? Yeah, you know, I think the future of, of PISA should mirror the future of foreign language learning. And in fact, you know, I, I've learned a lot through the study that we are publishing today on how young people, how teachers really see the future of language learning and language teaching. You know, the first thing, you know, I take away really is that, you know, it's about shifting emphasis from teaching to learning, you know, teach less, learn more, give students greater room for agency, you know. And uh, I give them, you know, more opportunities to speak, to talk, to interact, to make learning more passive, more interactive, and so on. I think that's a really, really important takeaway, and that should be mirrored in the way we assess foreign language skills. If we think that speaking is important, then, you know, the foreign language assessment should mirror that so that we actually set the right framework, the right incentives, you know. I also thought, you know, Hanan just made a really important point, you know, uh, give young people, the agency, the courage to try things out, you know. Why are small kids so much better in language learning than we as adults? You know, I know some people say it has to do with neuroscience and the brain development, and, you know, probably that's a big part of the picture, but there's something else. You know, for small kids, we tolerate if they make mistakes and we help them, you know, we give them correct. I mean, we have a very immersive environment for teaching languages. In school, we still often have, you know, a punitive environment. You made a mistake, I mock it in red and so on. So I do think, you know, that's something I'd like to see in the way we teach and learn languages, but also in the way in which we assess it. Uh, in the past, you know, we have separated learning and assessment. We have divorced them. In the future, probably a good assessment should give people, students, more immediate, more interactive feedback on how they learn. You know, like a computer game, I think that's very important. You know, I think Anna said we should see smaller group sizes to see more room for interaction. You know, I think that's a, that's, that's a really good point. But, you know, it's unlikely to happen in the resource environments. And I would say, you know, maybe we, should, we can use technology in more, more, more creative ways to actually create more space inside the classroom and outside the classroom for learning to become more personal, more interactive. The, uh, Sasha, you managed e-twinning. Um, uh, you mentioned e-twinning, you know, bringing students in contact, bringing schools in contact to facilitate learning uh, languages outside the classroom settings. Again, something you know, I'd like to pick up in an assessment, at least in the questioner. 
and where, where, we, where we study, you know, and what are the contexts, the environments in which young people learn. So I think that's a lot that we can take uh, away from from this and how we should frame design and, and, and implement future assessment. You know, I think the best foreign language assessment in the long run is present but not visible. It's just, you know, working in the background and providing students with the right analytics, teachers with the right analytics on how to learn better, teach better. And I think, um, it, I think Hannah made a very important point through something like PISA FLA, we're gonna see, you know, how all of those different approaches actually play out in terms of, you know, better student knowledge and skills. You know, at the moment we have lots of hypotheses that, diversity that you see across you know the countries that we studied and you know when you start how much how many hours you invest how you learn how the interactions are they're all hypotheses and we really need better data to understand what works best in what circumstances and in order to design future foreign language and assessment more intentionally more productively thanks so much Andreas. yeah absolutely you know i, I think what, what you're saying about teachers and education systems needing to become more creative and in terms of thinking about the box in terms of the way that uh, English language uh, is is taught, I think are, is, is, it resonates a lot with what people in the chat have been saying that, you know, it's all well and good to say we should have smaller class sizes, more opportunities for uh, bi-directional interaction, but actually if there's teacher shortages, then how can we do this? So I think what you're saying, you know, really makes a lot of sense. Um, so I do want to pick up on some of these issues around technology and go back to our panel. We only have nine minutes left, so it's going to be a very quick lightning round. But before we do Stavros, I want to ask a question to you that's been asked in the chat uh, by Zuelia. Uh, Zuelia wants to know whether you play online video games, and if you do, uh, do you play those games in English or in uh, Greek or in a mixture of both? Uh, what kind of languages uh, do you use? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Thanks. So, yeah, just curious about what uh, if you play online video games and if you do, uh, what language do you do you speak when you're in those games? Okay. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Be having Stavros might be having some technical issues, so we'll come back to establish no problem. Um, so let's very quickly go to the question uh, around digital technologies. Hanan, could you maybe walk us through? Um, very quickly, how digital technologies can actually help uh, assess language proficiency? Right, we're seeing uh, um, we're seeing more and more tests that are that, that are using AI. So, for example, there are tests for uh, employment, uh, and this has happened before COVID, but it increased after uh, COVID. So, um, and and they use um, feedback as well for assessment, which is very very which which is uh, quite rapid. Game-based learning is, is a great way of doing it, actually finding, going into an escape room and uh, uh, digitally and using using directions in English uh, is, is both fun and you learn new uh, language and uh, vocabulary. Wonderful, thanks so much, Anand. Uh, Selma, quick view from you from uh, Finland, from the classroom. Uh, digital technologies and tools, I mean, how can they be used in your case? Uh, like you know, plus and minuses when we think about it, it's definitely motivating. And we are just you know teaching also to 21st century skills like digital skills when kids like preparing is for example like a game or animated video. They are using not only English, they are presenting in the classroom, and we can also use like you know planning and then during the lesson and assessments. But definitely there are things to be careful. We didn't talk about in this like in a webinar about ethical issues or like easy access to information but what kind of information they are teaching so it needs a lot of effort and then preparation and challenges for the teacher so we have to be careful but definitely we need to find some places for the technologies Thanks so much, Anna. Yeah, issues around privacy and data protection, very important. And I know, Anna, the EU is really a, a global leader on many of these issues. Uh, talk, talk to us very quickly about, you know, uh, how this is reflected in some of the, the European Commission's uh, views on this. Yes, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, these tools have proven efficient. They can help the teachers, you know, design the, the tests, but also the classrooms, you know, 
built me a built me a text in B1 uh, English uh, with 10 questions attached to it uh, for working in the classroom. Uh, for the, the kids, as we were saying before, it can give this individualized attention. Um, but let me say it's not just for English because also digital tools could be precisely used to support the learning of those languages that are threatened that we were saying before or that are not taught in schools, you know, like uh, precisely what, what we cannot do in the classrooms. Um, so what can we do? Tell teachers how to benefit from, from this so that the continuous professional development of teachers, update their competencies, uh, learn how to better use technologies in the classroom. And as a matter of fact, the European Commission has been cooperating for many years on this with the European Centre for Modern Technology of the Council of Europe. And we have an initiative called ICT Ref, which is precisely training language teachers in, in new technologies. And this project has developed a very large in inventory of freely available online tools uh, and open uh, resources. Uh, so I invite teachers in the audience, I can put it in the chat to take a look at, at the website of the ICT Ref uh, project. Uh, we are also offering material and courses for teachers through the European School Education Platform that again is open to all. And uh, maybe Finally, just to mention that the Erasmus Plus project always also gives online language courses to all the participants going through mobility. Uh, it's what we call the online language support or OLS platform. Thanks so much, Anna, for those examples. Andreas, <clears throat> quickly now on the uh, on the role of governments again. I mean, you mentioned this uh, a bit in your previous uh, answer, but what do you what role do you see for uh, policymakers in this whole discussion around digital technologies uh, in education? Well, you know, I think we've seen how much of a role technology plays in the learning of foreign languages. I think we can build it into the assessment as well. I think, and uh, I do think policy has a really important role to play that more young people aren't able to interact with the world to, you know, understand what's going on, to, to understand, you know, how the connections are across the world. I do believe, you know, the learning of foreign language is the foundation to be able and uh, willing to engage with the diversity that we find in our in our culture said, you know, this is what has made countries always successful, you know, uh, have having people who can connect the dots where the next big idea can come from. And this is really what language learning is about. Thanks so much, Andreas and Stavros. I want to give you the last word. If you could share one last point with our group here today, we'd really appreciate it. Tell us a little bit about uh, your optimistic for your English language journey going forwards. Uh, you expect to uh, be working in English in the future. Uh, where do you see yourself uh, in about 10 years with English language? Um, I hope to go to a university out of this. And the English will help me to do this. Uh, if I have the length, I would do Erasmus because now I can't for a lot of reasons. And the English, I believe it's a key for the is and will help me to a lot of things. Wonderful. If you could go anywhere, where would you go? Right now. <laughs> okay. Um, in Strasbourg. Strasbourg, interesting. Lovely city. I go to December and I like it very much. Oh, very good. Oh, and you went in the winters and you and you and you still liked it. So that's a good sign. No, it's a wonderful yes. city. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Stavros. Well, I think we're just about out of time. So I want to send extend a huge thanks uh, to all of our panel members who joined us today, um, to all of our audience members. We had hundreds of people from around the world that uh, took part in the webinar today. Um, and I encourage all of you to uh, read the report. I think we've posted a link to it in the chat um, to anyone who's learning English themselves. Uh, feel free to like all of our social media channels and all of the social media channels of uh, the members of this chat uh, and you'll be uh, sure to pick up some interesting tidbits in the english language on education um, so huge thanks to everyone uh, and i wish you all a good day thanks